The following talk represents a summary of available previously published scientific research in the field of science, outreach and communication. The summarized research is not my own. This talk was part of the Global Harmonization Initiative Congress, which took place in the Netherlands in March 2019. Okay, so next speaker is then our colleague, Livina Ristosova. Yeah. And please, a few words about you before you start your presentation. Thank you very much. My name is indeed Livina Ristosova. I'm here as one of the co-chairs of one of the newest GHI working groups on science communication and talk about not only the importance of educating others, in regions where education is not necessarily freely available, but also the importance of doing that in local languages. So I would start with a rather bold statement that nowadays science communication is largely, unfortunately, a preaching to the choir activity, that for 70 years now, or more even, since the advent of the Cold War, when uh, increased science communication efforts has started, at least in the Western world, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of people who conduct scientific communication and scientific outreach activities. In the past 10 years even, you can uh, notice a dramatic increase in the scientists present on Twitter, which I'm not going to debate now the pitfalls and, and benefits of scientific uh, communication on social networks, but at least one of 40 scientists nowadays is on Twitter. And if you think about how many scientists are currently working in the OECD countries alone, which is about 1% based on some estimates, that's a huge number of people who are on Twitter spreading word about their research and oftentimes doing it in a way that uh, cautiously uh, they're trying to do it in a language that is accessible for other Twitter users. And obviously the more and more tools that we get nowadays that are also becoming available for scientists to spread their uh, research and the uh, outcomes of their uh, activities allows them to reach wider publics. At the same time, while this is happening, unfortunately, we see also a huge increase in vaccine hesitance, the occurrence of numerous uh, health and food fads, there is increase in climate change denialism and there is also increase in the food in mistrust in the food industry and food scientists. Despite everything, the food that we consume today is safer than ever before. So clearly between these two sides there is a gap that is not being addressed by the scientists and science communicators, nor by the other stakeholders involved in these activities. And I would argue that this gap, at least for a big part of the world, is actually the language. Because a big part of the science communication nowadays is still conducted in English, because people, rightfully so to an extent, assume that if they communicate about their research in English, they would reach uh, more numerous audiences. While this might be true in pure numbers, it doesn't necessarily mean that they reach the audiences that they're actually in highest needs or in, in most dire needs of receiving that scientific information for their well-being uh, and livelihood. And this is a, well, a, a map that I borrowed from Wikipedia. Uh, it shows you the uh, concentrations of English speakers around the world. And according to some of the latest estimates, only 15% of the world population speaks English at all and only 5% is being a native speaker. And you yourself, coming from all different parts of the world, you can attest to the fact that being a, a native speaker in one language and being able to speak the language not as a mother tongue can make quite a significant difference in your ability to understand certain messages and to convey certain messages as well. Even more so, in the countries where English is supposed to be the predominant and official, or in some cases only language, even there, the, uh, the numbers of English speakers are not 100% in all cases. So that is making a case for the fact that as much as language is our, as part of our culture and our identity, I would like to, to stress the fact that food is even more so part of who we are and how we identify ourselves. You can give me an example, I'm sure everyone in this room, if you think of your own country, I'm sure you can think about at least two regions where the language is exactly the same, but the food habits and food preferences have some differences which actually are part of the self-identification of the people. So the fact that you try to communicate some uh, healthy or food safety related or nutrition related change to them that would make their life better, 
doesn't necessarily uh, compute because uh, you're asking someone to change who they are by asking them to change their food habits. So in doing that in a foreign language, not in their local language, makes the exercise even harder and the chances of your message going through very low. Uh, there's a tricky balance that is still to be met between uh, doing science and publishing science in English and in other languages. There are obvious benefits for having one common language for scientists and that arguably nowadays is English. And obviously an example for this uh, benefit is that everyone ideally should have access to all the data of all science being conducted around the world, which would be a great thing. I'm not going to talk about paywalls here, so it's not necessarily the case. But an argument in support for having one common language for conducting science and not science communication is an example uh, from China where in 2004 there was a report published in Chinese in a small veterinary uh, journal which described the transition of avian flu to pigs and pigs are also uh, susceptible to human viruses which actually should have alerted the world and the health organizations that this is a potentially huge problem. The thing is that because this was published in Chinese, uh, it was largely missed by a big part of the uh, health organizations until much later when the problem became apparent in hospitals and medical centers. At the same time, an argument to consider while having English or whichever language is a common language of scientists is that while it presents moderate to little effort to learn one language for the payoff of having at hand all the scientific research at your disposal, is that many times non-native scientists report issues from publishing journals and reviewers. For example, that they're being judged more on the quality of their English and writing rather than the quality of their science which I don't think I need to convince you that this is uh, not supposed to be the case. And even for countries where English is quite well spread and the conduct of English is quite good among the population, there's observed a very significant trend that scientists publish, for example, in, here in the Netherlands, for every one paper that is being published in, in Dutch language in science, there are at least 40 published in English. So there's a huge transition in that as well. And, of course, um, there are specific cases where the publication of scientific results in local languages is actually highly desirable. And this is the case, for example, from a 2014 survey where scientists have searched Google Scholar uh, publications published only in 2014, and they found out that more than one-third of the more than 75,000 publications that they found in Google Scholar were published in languages other than English. That doesn't mean to say that they were published in just one single language other than English, but in, I think, 16 was the, the, the number that they quoted. And while that might seem like a lot, and might seem like a problem to me and you if, you have, if we assume that we have a good conduct in English, it actually turned out to be a problem for people who were supposed to benefit the most from that research. Uh, because that research was in biodiversity conservation, so they then went and interviewed 24 Spanish directors in bioconservation, and it turned out that more than half quoted that the biggest problem for their work is the little access to information in their language, which meant that actually this more than third of the 75,000 articles was not sufficient for them to actually do their, do their work uh, correctly and um, to the best quality. So then, teaching in native languages has been studied in several case studies, and there's the title of this meta-analysis conducted in Nigerian uh, children. It basically concluded that there is a, obviously a significant relationship between the comprehension of language and the comprehension of scientific concepts. Uh, it also showed that, provided that the children, the, the pupils in Nigeria, are able to experience the scientific concepts in their own environment and with examples from their immediate environment, including language, actually increased significantly their ability to comprehend 
uh, scientific concepts and furthermore to pursue scientific careers. Obviously, it was shown that a primary interference from teaching science in English as compared to local languages was the fact that, obviously, uh, one scientific term can mean one thing in science. Uh, it can mean something different in lay English, and it can sometimes mean something completely different in the mother tongue of the pupils, and that often connect, uh, uh, creates uh, disconnection and disinterest in the subject matter. And it was shown that even if taught in English, the local students have a higher success rate in their scientific studies when the material was tailored, again, with examples from their local environment, uh, despite the fact that it wasn't done in their own language. I would like to draw your attention to a few of the conclusions from this book that came out, I think, in 2014. And it made a point for how human rights in language and STEM education um, are basic human rights. So according to the UN, the access to education and to a quality education is a basic human right nowadays. But as of 2014, it turns out that a quarter billion children around the world fail to receive basic quality science education and understand scientific principles. And that stems from the fact that oftentimes educational aid from the Western world to regions where um, uh, it's being provided is usually, again, not tailored to the uh, local context. It's not done in the local language. And there's little to no follow-up on the student's performance. So basically, her, um, the author's conclusion was that science taught in a manner that it is today in many regions of Africa and Asia, for example, is actually violating children's rights, and that obviously is something that we need to do something about. An interesting example of how science communication, both on food and health, from the US can actually uh, be presented in, in very striking numbers is an example from the 96, uh, the middle of the 90s, where the US FDA required all enriched cereal grains to be fortified with folic acid in order to prevent development defects in the early stages of the pregnancy. What they failed to include in their recommendation list was to mention the core mass of flour, which is usually a very popular product for the Hispanic population in the US. More than 10 years later, what happened is that researchers went to markets that are specifically marketing to the Hispanic population in the US, and they selected a number of products that are um, predominantly purchased by the Hispanic population and tested it for the presence of folic acid. You would not be surprised, probably, by the fact that only two out of 41 products were labeled as containing folic acid, which um, in turn was happening at the same time while it was known that for Hispanic mothers, the, the risk of having uh, birth defects related to malnutrition and folic acid was two times higher in the US as compared to other racial and ethnic groups. It was also known in those 10 years and before that that it was uh, less likely for Hispanic women to take food supplements. And it was also very well known that once the pregnancy was established, Switching to folic acid enriched grains or supplements was already too late because the defects in the fetus can occur be before the four weeks of development and uh, usually the pregnancy is not established before that. So uh, final obvious differences to think about when you're, when you're educating students and when you're communicating to your fellow members of the public. Obviously, for science students, provided that the scientific programs are developed well, they have pre-existing knowledge or at least interest in science. So they are there to study. They take active participation in the, in the learning process, so you have a bit of an easier job to convey your message to them. They have the internal motivation, and they have a continuous exposure. So if you're talking about college, it varies between two, three to maybe 10 years of exposure to constant uh, talk about scientific concepts. So something is bound to stick, even if it's not the, the most interested student. At the same time, members of the public have little to no knowledge in most times. So you uh, have a tougher job to convey your message 
in a very clear terms and uh, to make the public understand. They're usually passively involved in the science communication process, so they rarely actively seek information or they don't even know where to seek information when they would like to do so. They have mm, many different medias that are competing for their attention, so you have a very low chance of competing with well-established media to actually deliver your message to the public that you're aiming for. And in most cases, you have just that one chance that you need that public whether if it's in a science festival or at the practitioner's office to actually convince that member of the public that something needs to be done and to actually make them remember what you're trying to tell them. So just to con you know, conclude, a bit idealistic probably, but uh, some obvious tasks to be undertaken uh, to conduct the scientific teaching in local languages as much as possible and if might be not necessarily the most feasible thing to at least adapt the curriculum with uh, culturally appropriate, appropriate materials. Also for uh, school children of the youngest age is to include science ethics and science history to in increase the interest towards science and the understanding of why science is being done the way is it done now. And for the um, uh, higher education students to include obligatory science communication in one-on-one -on -one classes, not for the sake of making every scientist a science communicator, but just to equip every scientist with yet another tool to conduct their science properly uh, and for the benefit of the society. Enabling scientists to deliver their research for um, continuous dialogue with the public because, again, one-off uh, communication is not going to cut it anymore.